Hi all. So picking off where we left off last chapter, we're going to be talking about monopolistic competition. Now we talked about monopolies, which were a company which had price making powers because it was the sole provider of a good. And we talked about perfect competition where we had a lot of buyers and a lot of sellers or a lot of buyers and a lot of sellers. And ultimately what that meant was that no one had price making capacity. However, markets, if ever, are rarely perfectly competitive. Most markets operate under imperfect conditions, and there's two types of imperfect conditions. The first off is oligopoly, which we'll get to in Chapter 17, and this is a market structure in which only a few sellers offer similar or identical products. Perfect example of this, Microsoft, Nintendo, Sony offering video game consoles. The games they offer are largely the same, but there's little differences between their products, but they ultimately do the same job. Monopolistic competition, however, and this is the focus of what we're going to talk about today, this is a market structure in which many firms sell products that are similar but not identical. So these markets are defined by the fact they have many sellers. Products are differentiated. There's free entry and exit into the market. And a good example to wrap your head around this idea is think about fast food. So fast food, right? Think about all the places that sell burgers. You have Wendy's, you have Burger King, you have Sonic, you have McDonald's all offering similar products, but their burgers are not the same, which gives them some leeway to price. So this figure is a great little reference for breaking down and deciding whether or not a firm in operation is a um, perfectly competitive monopoly, monopolistic competition, or oligopoly. And the first question you need to ask yourself is how many firms are there in this market? If there's only one firm, well, that's easy enough. That's monopoly. These are things like tap water, cable, TV. If you have a few firms, however, this is an oligopoly. Things like sports equipment, like tennis balls, and cigarettes. However, if you have many firms, the question we have to ask ourselves are, are these firms' products differentiated? Or are they identical? Well, if they're identical, this is what we talked about for competition. These are things like wheat and milk. Like, no one has better cows than other cows. However, if they're differentiated, then we're into a market called monopolistic competition. These things, things like books, movies, but I think fast food is um, theory to keep up with. So how does competition with differentiated products work? Well, the monopolistically competitive firm in the short run operates a lot like a monopoly. It has a unique product facing a downward sloping demand curve. So basically, since the monopolist is the only seller of their product, you don't necessarily have the entire market demand for, in our case, fast food hamburgers, but what they do have is a demand for their fast food burgers. And because they give it this, the, for example, for talking about Wendy's, what Wendy's ha faces is how many people want our hamburgers and how much are they willing to pay for our hamburgers. And so for Wendy's, they have the same profit maximizing decision that a monopolist and a perfectly competitive firm has. They price it where their marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And similar to a monopolist, the um, a monopolistic competitor is able to then go up to the demand curve for their good, find where the demand, um, the price at that demand, and at the price at that demand, they they know that this is where they're going to sell their product at. As long as that price is greater than the average total cost of making their product, this firm will make a profit. And again, so just a reminder, the steps are identify the profit maximizing quantity. That's where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So at this point, the second point is to trace up at this quantity and find where this quantity intersects the demand curve. Where that happens, that tells you how much the firm will charge in price. And then finally, find now that we have this price, find out what the average total cost is at this quantity. So go down, find the average total cost, and this tells you the cost for the firm. So... This doesn't necessarily mean a monopolistically competitive firm always makes a price. Average total cost could easily be higher than the demand curve. And if that's the case, what we find is where our marginal revenue equals marginal cost. We trace up to our demand curve. The demand curve determines our price. But unfortunately, our average total cost is greater than our price. And so we operate with a negative economic loss. And just remember, you can calculate the area of that rectangle by doing price minus average total cost times quantity. Now you might go, wait, what if average total cost is greater? Well, no, that still works because that tells you you're making a negative economic profit. Now, the long run equilibrium for a monopolistically competitive uh, market means that free entry and exit 
firms until firms have uh, reduced economic profit. Basically, there's characterized by two aspects. Price exceeds marginal cost because profit maximization required marginal revenue equals marginal cost, and the downward sloping demand curve means marginal revenue is less than price. Since price equals average total cost, in the long run, what we find is that monopolistic competitors will have their profit reduced. And so even though they have pricing powers, they can wind up in a spot at a point that they are no longer making economic profit. So as this example shows, in the long run, a monopolistic competitor still has pricing power. They still choose to optimize where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. However, this price is now going to intersect with the average total cost because where they're making economic profit, this means other firms can enter the market. To give you a good example, in Athens, there's a pretty big craft brewery industry. Originally, it was just Terrapin, and Terrapin was a successful, um, really successful brewery. And then with Terrapin success, other firms realized, hey, this isn't too difficult to get into, so we're going to start our own breweries. And they were very profitable, and then more entered. Eventually, there will hit a point where a craft brewery can't be profitable in Athens. And when that does occur, ultimately firms exit the market. And ultimately it, this depends upon where what firms can profit where average total cost equals their price. Um, a monopolistic competition versus perfect competition. There's two key differences we need to note here. Excess capacity exists in monopolistic competition. And what that means is monopolistic firms do not produce at the efficient scale where average total cost is minimized. So remember, when we say efficient scale, we're talking about the point where the marginal cost intersects the average total cost. So where marginal cost intersects average total cost, overall cost is minimized, and this is the efficient scale. In other words, monopolistic firms could increase their production and further reduce their average total cost. However, that would minimize their profit, and so they don't do that. Additionally, they're able to mark up over their marginal costs. So monopolistic firms charge similar to how monopolies charge, with the price corresponding to the quantity demanded at which they prof maximize profit. So as you can see here in slide 47, we can put these comparisons side by side. So while both firms, their marginal revenue is intersecting average total cost in the long run, notice that the price is a little lower in the perfectly competitive market and the quantity produced is much higher. The reason why is because again, we are constrained in the sense that we are not the entire market, and so we have an excess capacity. Marginal cost won't intersect average total cost until this point, the efficient scale point, and but marginal revenue and marginal cost intersect at a lower quantity, so we have excess capacity. And just a reminder, you can think of excess capacity as simply the difference between the efficient scale quantity and the quantity produced for profit maximization. Similarly, the markup we can find as the price required to sell all the units over the marginal cost required to make those products. For the perfectly competitive firm, price equals marginal cost. So how does monopolistic competition affect the welfare of society? Well, we do have the product variety externality, and this is because consumers get some consumer surplus from the introduction of a new pro product Entry of a new firm conveys a positive externality for consumers. So for example, think about Subway sandwiches and sa um, sandwich shops in general. My favorite sandwich shop, honestly, is Jersey Mike's now. Jersey Mike's wasn't really here in Georgia or in Arkansas, where I'm from originally, for a while. So this is a new benefit and a new externality that we get, is that we now have more sandwiches available to us, we have more options, we get more diversity. Um, similarly, we have the business stealing externality. This is that the problem that because other firms lose customers and profits from the entry of a new competitor, entry of a new firm imposes a negative externality on existing firms. So just because a new firm enters and that's a benefit to consumers and that's positive for consumers, there is an aspect of this that it does negatively impact other producers. Um, and just to kind of wrap that up, right, we said that firms are operating with short-term profits, but in the long run, the ability of new firms to enter means that ultimately they will wind up either exiting the market or making zero economic profit. Now, this does lead us to an interesting question of advertising. Is this value adding or wasted resources? And so the debate here is that critics view it as manipulating taste and preferences beyond a product's merits, and this impedes competition. However, the defense is it provides information to customers such as prices, exists new products, and fosters competition. 
One of the big components here is advertising signals uh, idea of quality. The fact a firm can spend money suggests the firm is a, a higher quality to begin with. Think about celebrity endorsements. So headphones are an industry that I find really fascinating and interesting. One of the big, big, big headphone companies, right, is Beats. Beats, though, spends a lot of their money on advertising, much more than they do on R&D. And Beats are owned by Apple, right? But Apple has been able to get um, things like LeBron James to do advertisements, like several NBA players do advertisements for Beats. Um, in contrast, Sennheiser, an amazing company of audio, they're a huge old audio firm, um, really well respected. They don't advertise at all. All their money goes to research and development. So there's a question of, is Beats uh, manipulating people away from companies like Sennheiser and suggesting they have higher quality? But at the same time, the reality is that the fact that we see um, celebrities using these items, right, that conveys that these are good items. The fact that people that could have anything else have chosen to work with this product means that they are good. And there's also something about saying that advertising creates a sense of identity that goes beyond just the um, physical material merits of the headphones. Ultimately, too, what this means, too, is that it creates the meaning behind brand names. There's a debate whether or not brand names symbolize real distinctions or whether they manufacture fictitious differences and distinctions were non-existent. Headphones, computers, wall chargers, for example. Um, wall charger, right? As long as it charges your phone, as long as it charges your computer, does it really matter what the brand name is? Um, computers, for example, similar thing. These are questions of does, for a Windows computer, does the brand name matter? And headphones, as I mentioned, Sennheiser is a company that doesn't advertise at all, but they are often considered one of the very best audiophile um, companies. Bose is another big audio company that has similar questions abounding. However, brand names ultimately convey information regarding quality where information may not exist. Just to give you one example, I if you walk into a place and you're looking for electronics and you see a product's branded Sony, you probably know that's a good product, right? Because Sony is someone that is incentivized to do quality control and protect the value of their name. Sony has a high reputation, a high quality reputation for multiple electronic products. They make great televisions. They make great um, gaming systems. They make great audio systems. So if you see something that's branded Sony, it's reasonable for you to expect that, yes, this will be a good product. Um, another example, though, is of this incentive to do quality control is a firm called Starbucks. Why is Starbucks coffee so bitter? Why is it so acidic? Well, it's over-roasted. And the reason it's over-roasted is that ensures a consistent flavor every time you go to Starbucks that otherwise might not exist. And so that's just an example of Starbucks, in order to protect their name, in order to prevent you from having a quote-unquote bad Starbucks experience, they do quality control. So... This was a quick chapter, but I do want to finish up with just referencing a quick summary of what we've learned. So we've now introduced three market structures, perfect competition, monopolistic competition, and monopoly. And the goal of all these firms, the features they all share, are they all want to maximize profits. They all determine that profit maximizing point by where their marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And they can all earn economic profits in the short run. Now, the features that monopolistic competition shares with monopoly, they both are price makers. They don't have to take the market price. And they both are able to price above their marginal cost. Neither also produces the welfare maximizing level of output. However, there are a few features that monopolistic competition shares with competition. There's many firms in both um, perfect competition and monopolistic competition. And there's free entry in the long run. And because there's free entry in the long run and many firms, that means that economic profits in the long run cannot exist as opposed to monopoly. All right, all. That's everything I have for you today. And in our next video, we're going to pick up for oligopoly. And this is going to be a really interesting chapter because we're going to get one of my favorite topics called game theory. Until then, take care.